I can just go right there, right there <laughs> when it's time. Okay. okay, so we can get started. Um, yep. Okay. Just straighten out my camera. Okay. Um, so thank you for coming today. Um, this is the third session of the day during um, the Recession Proofing Your Bridal Design Business Summit Series. Um, today, we are going to be talking about um, sourcing and production for sustainability. Um, I have Jelana Faulkner on, who she's going to introduce, her, uh, introduce herself, um, but I think that you guys will really get a lot of value out of what Jelana has to talk about um, and share with us designers today. So Jelana, take it away. Yay, thank you so much, Danny, for having me on. Um, I am, I was thrilled to be asked. And I, I love that there's, you're putting together a summit and a platform for us to support each other and exchange ideas and um, share what we're seeing in the landscape. So um, as Danny mentioned, I'm Jelana Faulkner and I own Jelana Marie Bridal. I also own the China Connect and together um, with the bridal business, I of course create custom wedding gowns for brides, but then on the other side, I provide um, consulting as well as travel and other services that connect bridal salons and designers with factory direct pricing, manufacturers and partners to help further their bridal business. So we do that by taking groups to China once or twice a year. We also offer services where we create vendor lists, depending on what it is you need, we can create a custom vendor list that gives you direct access to um, suppliers that have been vetted and verified. So that's what we do. And um, I'm excited to share my background and what I've seen in terms of what's happening and the impact with COVID. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to ask you, well, before I, before I start with that, I just want to introduce myself to anyone who just came on and joined now. Um, my name is Danny Simone. Um, this is the Global Bridal Sustainability Summit. It is a series of summits and um, will also be master classes, workshops, things like that, in which um, I will bring together experts who will share on things that us bridal designers need to know in order to grow our businesses. Like I said, this is the recession proofing your um, bridal business um, summit, the very first one. Um, and the reason why I invited Jelana on is because, you know, I think that her business, well, sorry, both of her businesses are super unique and as well as awesome. And they are a testament to the fact that if you as a designer are just creative and use what you know um, and want to support others, build a community and help one another out, um, you can really live your passion. Um, so that's why I invited her on. Um, and before, you know, we get into like the deep sourcing questions and things like that, I just want to know, Jelana, what made you um, decide to start both of your businesses? So first of all, what made you decide to get into bridal? And then what made you decide to um, create the China Connect? Awesome question. So I have been a creative at heart since I was a tiny baby. And also, you know, some people say that entrepreneurship is in your blood. Other people say you just fall into it. Well, it's actually in my blood, both sides of my family's chock full of successful entrepreneurs in a variety of different businesses. And of course, like a lot of us, I had a grandmother who sewed, although I was too young to really pick up a lot of the skills, I picked up the love for creating, I think, from her. And after I graduated college, I was you know, trying to find myself and, and figure out what it is I wanted to do with my talents, my degree, and all this, all these things that I love to do. And I ended up taking a sewing class. I was just bored with life, really. And I just started at sewing class. And when I had my first session, I immediately caught on. I just became really good at it really fast. And I started to create my own workwear. Well, from there, I had customer, or not, I didn't have customers. Then I had friends and family colleagues who would say, oh my God, that suit is so cute. Or those that skirt is adorable. Can you make me one? So I started making career clothes for other women in my city. And then I did that for a number of years. I initially started source. I was making everything in my own home. 
I reached out, long story there, about, um, I, I knew I wanted to scale, so I ended up working with a small family facility in Vietnam. Those clients started to get married, and I just put those skills that I had learned, the business development um, skill set that I had developed, and I started creating wedding gowns. It wasn't that easy. It took me about a year to perfect the craft and really be proud of the, the gowns that I was creating. Um, but a lot of the same rules, techniques apply to creating a you know, suit or an evening gown. So um, pivoting into wedding dresses was just a natural fit. After the first two to three years of doing wedding dresses, I decided to pivot and focus exclusively on bridal. And um, that has been the case in terms of clothing for, the, for a number of years now. And within the past three years, I started focusing on the B2B side of things, looking at the network I had developed in China, both in Vietnam, and started helping other designers and um, bridal salon owners do the same thing that I had done, which is connect to the right partners, enabling my business to scale, serve more customers, maintain the right quality levels, and allow me to start exploring other lines of business. So that's um, how I started my bridal business and how the China Connect got started. And so it's been a very interesting journey, um, full of ups and downs, full of, you know, those really critical decision moments. And uh, right now we're in the middle of another critical, um, in very highly impacting moment in our careers in terms of bridal. And I'll tell you a bit about right now, both of those business where our focus is now due to COVID. So for me, I've been struggling and, and trying to adjust my business per COVID since January. We had a tour, fully booked out tour scheduled for March. And in January is when a lot of my suppliers and vendors, ones that we were scheduled to meet with, started giving me heads up and warning us about this virus and that Chinese New Year would be extended and they just weren't really sure where things would go. So I was managing that crisis back in January with my um, tour clients. And then of course, as China stayed shut down, Chinese New Year extended, it impacted my bridal business because at this point, my projects that were due to be um, completed in the February and March were now pushed out to April and May. So it was a bit of a, a scary moment because I had no idea when factories would reopen or we'd be able to get back to business. So we've been um, dealing with COVID from a number of angles for several months now. Well, at least um, Jan since January. Yeah, I mean, it has definitely been tough. And I think that a lot of people, um, they may not understand that the reality is most of not only what we wear on a regular basis, but the, even the components that are needed to, um, you know, to make our clothes. So the fabrics, the buttons, the notions, the zippers, all that mm -hmm. stuff, those mostly all come from China or from um like maybe Vietnam, who maybe does the first assembling or something, and they send it over to China for finishing. Um, and then maybe you get it here in the U.S., and then you can make your um, domestically handmade dress. But we're a global um, ecosystem. We're not just, um, you know, it, it can't just be um, American-made, because unfortunately, America is not yet fully set up, or the U.K., like a lot of these countries are not yet fully set up, to um, handle um, this disruption in the supply chain and start making everything themselves. We're not there yet. So mm -hmm. um, one of the reasons why I wanted to talk with Jelana is because she has that, um, you know, that private insight. Is that the right word? I don't think that's the right word. <laughs> she has the insight to know like that this is all, um, this is a circular supply chain and it includes several countries and um, the bridal and the wedding industry is hurting, but so are other parts of fashion, so are other parts of manufacturing, even food production is hurting right now. Um, so on the one hand, we're gonna talk about, you know, a lot of this um, pandemic 
uh, stuff that's going on. I know designers are like having a hard time finding the fabrics they need. But then we're also going to talk about why um, you may want to start trying to work with overseas. Um, some things that I've personally noticed, um, and I'm sure she's noticed as well, um, is that there are a lot of factories that are searching for people to, you know, let them design or, sorry, manufacture their lines. There are a lot of opportunities out there. So if you're an independent designer, um, you may want to start looking into China if you weren't before. Um, can you speak to that? Like, can you speak to um, like some of the opportunities that exist now because the bigger brands have canceled so many orders? Yeah, so, um, and really this is a, a perspective that is more, a little bit more broad than just bridal. Um, I work with manufacturers that work with bridal brands. And then also I work with other entrepreneurs that are in other areas of um, retail. But specifically, what I am noticing is more contacts are reaching out to me to say, we're, we know you guys are in the middle of the pandemic. We know a lot of weddings have been pushed back. We know a lot of business is shuttered right now. Bridal stores aren't open. But when the time is right, when it does reopen, we want to be your partner. We're ready. Our facilities are back up. So they're trying to um, stay ahead of the need. They're trying to initiate conversation more so now than ever, because think about it. I think China's um, GDP shrunk by about 15 to 20 percent. And you're talking about a multi, multi, multi trillion dollar economy that is billions of dollars that is missing that completely evaporated from their economy as well so they themselves are now like you said opening themselves up to different business so one factory in particular out of sucho initially they would only work with designers if they were getting five items made of the same design but now the minimums are gone you can work with this manufacturer to get one gown made with you know one design per gown one gown per design so they're also trying to think of ways to get creative to be more flexible because they understand that everyone has been impacted so for sure there are more opportunities and let me talk a little bit about um, what i'm seeing in terms of pricing so across the board we saw an increase in prices for both raw goods, like your zippers, buttons, notions, all of your fabric, and then also for finished goods, finished commodities, those things that we're importing that are already created, like our tiaras or maybe um, belts and things like that. Um, so prices really did have a spike, and a ridiculous spike, partially because shipping has now increased a great deal because there are fewer flights. So even though um, the crisis is, is based around scarcity of PPE items, all of the other items are still available, but the shipping backlog is affecting every industry. So whether you're bringing in a dress that you ordered, or maybe you got 10 dresses coming in, you're looking at higher shipping prices as well as higher material prices, um, just so that they can try to make up some of that shrinkage that happened from the virus. So price increase, yes. Um, there are some ways that you can negotiate. There are some things that if you're buying uh, retail, like off the rack gowns, ready-made gowns, there are some ways that you can negotiate. But for the most part, I think we're going to see a slight increase in prices, at least until your shipping carriers, your freight forwarders, your freight industry, until that gets back to a normal, able to normal, handle normal capacity, we're going to definitely see the sustained increase in pricing. The increase in materials costs should trickle down. The more people get back to work, the more people start placing the orders, the better the you know Chinese workers in factories can feel about being able to meet their needs in terms of paying employees and getting the supplies in that they need to create things. The more confidence is built on both sides will definitely have an impact on pricing 
in a good way, meaning that it comes down. But for right now, we're all looking at an um, increase in price, which is really ill time because we're all you know wondering what's going to happen are our brides going to return to us are they going to go forward with their weddings are they going to still want this four thousand dollar gown that i'm in the middle of making or that they've paid a deposit for so a lot has yet to be seen in terms of what we can expect from couples in terms of spending habits but um i do have so i've talked to several colleagues that own bridal salons and they seem to be really optimistic, Danny, because the brides that they've heard from, they are intending on keeping their orders the same or perhaps spending more. So it really depends on their perspective. If their jobs weren't impacted, then perhaps they're going to stay where they are. They also, this person I was talking to also mentioned that people who ended up being on unemployment, you know, there's a $600 plus um, uh, stipend for people that are on unemployment per week. And for a lot of people, that's a couple extra thousand dollars a month that they may not have otherwise made even with their full-time job. So some people are in a better position now with unemployment payments. So I think it remains to be seen how people's perceptions or uh, spending habits change after uh, COVID. I had to unmute myself real quick. <laughs> um, yeah, like absolutely. I noticed it, similar things. Um, this conversation is great because I don't go as deeply into the sourcing and understanding like the raw goods too deeply. Like I might connect people with factories, things like that. And mostly I only focus on bridal. Um, I do sometimes get other types of manufacturers who will reach out to me and say, I make swimwear, <laughs> you know, would you like to do that? Um, but do you have any tips for if people are reaching out to you, like manufacturers are reaching out to you and they want to work with you and you're a designer and likely you might be low on funds. Do you have any tips for negotiating terms that would be favorable to um, your business as a small independent designer who might want to try outsourcing and working with overseas? Yes. So... Whenever um, I am in a negotiation situation, of course, the biggest goal is to reduce your expenditure. So you're trying to get a cheaper price. But I always advise my clients to think beyond price because your cost to obtain this item involves more than just that bottom line price. There are a lot of variables that goes into your total cost for that item. You've got the variables, the um, different interchanges and levels that happen just to create the item. Then you've got the shipping piece, which if, you know, depending on how fast you need it, depending on where you want it to go, you could also negotiate a better shipping rate. So here's three ways that I think people can use just without having to know a lot about sourcing and freight forwarding and things like that. So think about how early you can start on a project. If you're anything like me, <laughs> you have this dis-ease called procrastination. And I tend to procrastinate getting started on certain projects because I don't need it for six months. I'm like, I've got plenty of time, right? I mean, this project, normally my manufacturers can have a dress ready in 45 days. So I'm like, I don't need to start today because I've got six months. Well, if you do yourself the favor of starting early, you have a much better chance of negotiating the price because you can always say, look, this is a low priority item. So put it on the back burner of your production line. I don't need it for two or three months. So this isn't something that has to be done right away. And what that does is it gives your manufacturer an opportunity to, A, maybe allow someone the opportunity to train, use this as a training opportunity. Of course, the professionals will be making your gown, but because you don't need it, they can take their time and walk through the process and explain what's going on and what's happening to someone that may be in training. They can't do that on projects that they need in 30 days. Um, the other thing is maybe they are trying a new cutting machine 
and perhaps your project might be one that they need to try to, to cut two or three times in order to get it perfected. So you give them the levity and the ability for flexibility within their own operations if you don't necessarily need that gown right away. So the first thing is to start early and use the fact that you don't need your gown for several weeks as a bargaining chip to say, okay, maybe you start out by saying, I need this in 45 days and they'll give you a price. And then you say, you know what? Things have changed. I don't actually don't need it for two months. Can you lower its priority and maybe give me a price break? So that's one method, if you will, that um, I use often. It may or may not work depending on their, their quantity of projects, but that's one thing that you can do. The other thing is that if there is a, I'm trying to think the best way to put this. So this is kind of a two in one. So most of us independent designers have our own designs that we want to submit and have created, meaning they have to create a new pattern. A lot of gowns are technically the same gown. A mermaid gown, when you look at its silhouette, you know, it's pretty much going to be the same. You may change out the sleeve design, the bodice, or perhaps the back is cut a little lower, or maybe the, the flare starts a little higher. Where I'm going with this is if, see if there's already a pattern in existence that you can modify slightly to get to your um, unique design. I do this a ton of times. Most of your manufacturers have a database of thousands of different patterns. And if your gown is, is not necessarily constructed similarly, but it has a similar silhouette, see if they will allow you to use their pattern and then just customize an already designed pattern, right? Makes total sense. It works all the time. And you can sometimes save a couple hundred, depending on what your dress costs. If you're paying between two to three to four to five hundred for a design, this could cost you or save you 150 bucks or more. So think about that. And you're able to speed up your timeline because they don't have to spend time you know, creating a pattern. Yes, write that down. Um, so that's number two, is to try to use a pattern that they already have. I think, I'm gonna, and I'm gonna give you guys permission to not feel like you're copying someone when we do this. A lot of times as independent designers, our pride and joy is seeing a design that we um, conceptualize that we illustrated and sketched and perfected the, um, you know, measure. I mean, we, we take pride in that. It's really a piece of artwork. But when you're thinking about scaling, think about the activities that really truly make you money. Is it the activity of, of having the pride of, you know, having your design in existence the way that you envisioned it, meaning new patterns and new all of that? Or is it to sell these designs as quick as possible so you can focus on the next design and get the next client in and out the door? It's, it's the second, let me tell you. <laughs> That's the money-making activity. So give yourself permission and grace to use what's already in place. Let's not recreate the wheel if we don't have to because you use a pattern that's already in place. Doesn't take away from your individuality, your talent, the look of your design. I mean, if it's already in, in existence, what is the value of recreating something that's already in existence? All you're doing is making an improvement. And that's how the car industry has gotten to where it is today. That's how, why Tesla is in existence. They're not recreating the way a car operates or the you know, look and feel of a car. They're improving on an existing design. So keep that in mind and give yourself permission to improve upon an existing design. It's still yours at the end of the day. Okay, so that was number two. Um, number three, let's talk a little bit about shipping. When you get ready to, to import these products or dress that you've designed, one of the awesome ways to save money is to, A, most things that are coming from China are coming via Express. So that's DHL, UPS, Worldwide Express, or international priority, those um, shipping methods will get your 
item here to you within a matter of days, four to five days, typically. But again, going back to number one, if we haven't procrastinated, we could qualify for air freight, not air express. Air freight is normally half the cost of your shipping. So if I'm shipping one dress, typically my shipping costs might be $70. It may be a hundred. It may be you know, 60, depending on how heavy the dress is, how big the box is, and all those good things. And if I ship it air freight, it might take seven to 14 days to get here, but I'm saving, you know, 50, 60 bucks. So if you are looking at a dress that maybe you're charging a few thousand on and you can save 50 or 60 bucks, Maybe that allows you to have better packaging, better presentation. Perhaps that just simply you put that back into your um, profit. So it's a lot of different ways, but I would say those three ways are the easiest and ones that you don't have to have that much experience with. Uh, those were awesome. Like super, super awesome. I want to go back and touch on a few of them because okay. those were like gold. So first of all, starting early, I think like a lot of designers and I'm one of them too, mm -hmm. we have a tendency to procrastinate. Like you said, like for whatever reason, it's like, oh, I have months to do this. I have this amount of time, but that time um, jumps up on you super, super fast. Um, and if you could figure out a way to bargain, um, you know, like that's a bargaining chip that you could use by mm -hmm. saying, look, I know I don't need this dress for X amount of time. You don't have to rush on it, you know? Mm -hmm. And they basically, especially if you work with a um, factory who is, you know, generally usually timely, they communicate well with you. Um, I've been working with one manufacturer since, I want to say 2016, and they are on it. Good. If they have a question, they are... Um, messaging me in the middle of the night if I don't answer they're messaging me over and over and over again to make sure I heard right. and then right. they're like we're waiting on you we're waiting on you you know like so you want to work with those type of factories but then that means that you're still a priority to them it's just that it doesn't have to happen so quickly so that was awesome thank you for that um and I just love that it would help you to negotiate your price and it definitely does. Yeah, and like in this time, if you think about it, there are probably going to be a lot of restructuring when it goes when it comes to um, workers. Okay, so they may have had access to certain workers before that are no longer available for mm -hmm. different reasons. So they right. have to hire someone else to be their cutter now or to be mm -hmm. their pattern maker now or whatever. So that person does need the training. Y you not making your um, items such a fast um, priority means they might be able to train them on your item, you know? And they're not going to hire somebody. If this is a good, um, a trustworthy uh, manufacturer or a sample room, they're not going to put somebody who can't sew, you know, on your on your stuff. I do know that we need to talk about how to find trustworthy um, manufacturers, but I just thought that was really good. But okay, so now number two, um, this one was big. Okay, so what I learned a long time ago was basically everything you said. Um, let's say you make your own patterns, you make your own dresses and things like that. You should know that it will be easier to use a pattern that exists and just do minor alterations to it in order to save money and time rather mm -hmm. than make a brand new pattern. But I think we as designers, we get so caught up in, I'm a designer, I'm creative, I want to be different, when it is absolutely the truth. Currently, there are like I think if we just thought about it, we could say how many number of dresses there are in the world. And they all look pretty similar. They just change the color, add yeah. applique, yeah, exactly. you know, add a strap, make the back a little bit lower. Those sort of things, um, those sort of things are, because brides are basically setting standards of what they want. So brides have wanted A-line dresses, mermaid dresses, um, trumpet, uh, sheath, you know, whatever. They've wanted these different types of dresses on and on for the last, who knows, I don't know, over 20 years or so. And all we're doing is adding our little touches here and there. So if the factory already has like this database of patterns, you literally could say, hey, can you send me um, pictures of what you have in stock? Then mm -hmm. design around that. And ask for pictures of their current lace, save money that way as well, instead of having them to order brand new stuff for you every single time. What do you have for beads? What do you have for zippers? What do you have for buttons? I think like 
as designers, we have to stop always thinking everything has to be super new, different and creative right. and think you're also a business owner. Are you making any money? If you're not making any money, you are actually just playing. <laughs> I mean, that's what I think sometimes, like you're really just playing. It is a hobby. Yeah, exactly. You're not being intentional about your pricing. Yeah. I think that's something we should talk about too, because there is a misnomer when, especially consumers, when we find out or hear that things are being made in China, there is this misnomer that it should be cheaper. Like it should be just automatically the you know cheapest thing out there. But a lot of what I've spent time doing is educating brides on everything that goes into their gown. And I don't do this in a, this is, you know, this is all we have to, this is what all goes into your gown. Da, 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 da. I filter and layer in our expertise, our creativity, our talent, skill set. I litter all of that into our conversation so that when I do get to that question, well, where are your gowns produced? Or a lot of times I'm telling it up front. I have teams who are based in the U.S. and based in China. Um, and I, I make it so that they don't, when they hear that word, they're already in the mindset of, okay, well, my dress is going to be actually put together there, but it's designed, conceptualized. It's literally created here in the U.S. In the mind of this uh, awesome designer and her team, they are doing the hard work. They're sourcing these fabrics. They're sending me these gorgeous, you know, fabric samples. Um, we give out a gift box, a bridal gift box, when we onboard a new bride. So they understand that the process is one that you can't get cheap. And the, the process is one of full of value because we off offer bridal styling sessions as well. Um, we give an alterations credit as well. So there's a lot that we layer in so that when we get to that, it's actually put together in China. That's not a leading thought. It's just a, oh, it's just part of the process thought. And that way there's no uh, negotiating my price. I mean, maybe we can negotiate with a bride depending on how we're feeling and how much we need to make, who that person is, what they're getting. I mean, you know, you understand the, you, sometimes the price you give a bride, is not the price you go with. However, there's none of this, oh, well, it's made in China, so this dress should be like $400, or I can go on Amazon and get a similar gown. So we have to be very strategic about how we present our fashions, how we present ourselves, and the value that we bring versus having the focus be on where our gowns are made. I think for some people it matters. I get it. But I want that to be the last thing on your mind is where my gown is made. Whether it's made in the USA, China, India, wherever, that should be the last thing on your mind. You shouldn't even have a question about it after I'm done with you. After we have our console and you understand how fabulous your gown is going to be. So we have to be salesmen and we have to be- what matters more. Yeah. Exactly. It's like how they feel about it. If they, if they, if you don't do a good job of explaining um, ahead of time, like everything that's going into it, creating an experience, um, really building up your brand in such a way that there's no question that this is a high value gown and a high value experience because they're not even paying for the gown anyway. They're just paying for the experience. Um, right. If they were paying just for the gown, then they would never talk to you, <laughs> you know, like right. they would have just gone on Amazon. And I know that like one of the things that, um, you know, this is this session isn't particularly about branding, but everything you said does go into, um, you know, the value and the pricing of the gown based on how we present ourselves. So that was, this is gold. This is all gold. I hope um, notes is being taken because over here they are, okay. <laughs> Um, okay, so the third thing you said that was really good, the shipping. So I think that um, if, just like you said, number one being don't wait for a long time, like start early, don't wait too late, don't procrastinate, because then you will need that four and five day shipping, which means that you got to pay $70 or God forbid, 
Yeah. yeah. You got to pay even more just to get the dress. It, so it's costing us even more now, almost yeah. two or three times as much. So that $70 should yeah. be that I was paying. Oh no. Just to get your box on a plane now yeah having to pay extra just to the freight forwarders to say hey here's a little extra to you ups and this is yeah. not a legal thing but this is what's really happening right mm -hmm. now you're having to yeah. pay stuff on a plane which is crazy which which basically points out like you said um to your point of this is a time basically like of being flexible and what you're going to try to do as a designer like this is all about flexibility I think um, if you really want to grow your business, you want to scale your business, you got to be flexible in this time because we're in a time that's kind of, it can be uncertain. Um, and the more flexible you are, those are the businesses that are going to grow. Mm -hmm. I think the big, big companies, that's why um, there are brands that are closing left and right. Because mm -hmm. number one, if you go to a store, a, a bridal boutique and the dress costs like $5,000, a lot of people don't know that that dress probably costs uh, like a fourth or a fifth of that, you know, mm -hmm. so maybe it's, maybe it's a $500 dress that they were able to mark up to $5,000. Whereas when you work with an independent designer, you're getting closer to what the dress um, is, was for like wholesale. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think like there has to be education on guys, you're buying from China in the first place. Like yeah, they don't realize that coming from there. That's so you're paying point. more you know, like they're paying more and don't even realize it. You got this big brand name on it and you think that, oh, I'll pay that much in the store, but you know, you're a smaller designer. I don't want to pay that much. And it's like, don't you understand? You're paying to keep their lights on. You're paying for their um, insurance and um, this thing and that thing, utilities and everything. And it's like with a small independent designer, you're paying for my expertise, my time, exactly. and then um, the hands that made it. That's what you're paying for there's not like, you know, tons of overhead that has to be covered. So the mm -hmm. quality issues, um, that is one of the reasons why I started working with China. I worked with India. Um, I, I do other types of design as well. So I do like cut and sew knits, denim, um, things like that. And I place those with like Bangladesh, um, mm -hmm. Pakistan. So I place it with different um, uh, countries. And the thing is that they are of professional quality. So mm -hmm. when you go in the store, you're getting the same quality of a dress or of a different clothing or product item, but you're getting it for less than the store can sell it for, exactly. you know? Yeah. And then I don't have to meet thousands and thousands of um, minimums. Exactly. So, yeah. So flexibility is super important right now. Mm -hmm. I have another question I want to ask you. Yeah. This is really good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, hold on. Sorry. My phone just went down. Okay. This is super important. Um, what do you think about the common us versus them attitude? So that's uh, domestically produced versus overseas. The last session actually we had um, bridal boutiques on who were basically talking about the difference in structure and things like that that happen when we have people sewing their dresses in, in their homes and I, or, or in their studios here in the US. Now, I do know that some designers um, do add structure in, but the general consensus from a lot of bridal boutiques is that the price that a lot of designers want for their dresses that they may, may have made here in the US does not equate to the quality in terms of structure that brides have to wear a lot of stuff beneath it. Um, you know, they'll get a, a dress for the same price or less that has the boning, mm -hmm. that has the built in cups that makes them look great. And then the dresses that are made by like the designer's own hands or whatever, they're unstructured, you know, like they need things added to them. So the dress might seem cheaper, but then you got to add on alteration and stuff. So mm -hmm. it's like, what do you think about designers who need to maybe start thinking about that? Um, if you could speak to, the, to, to some insight on the us versus them and how we can kind of change that narrative and change our mindset on it. Yeah, well, you mentioned something when we first started um, the conversation, and that was the word ecosystem. And I, based just on what that word means, the ecosystem of bridal means that there are various players that create the sum total of the bridal industry. 
And just if you want to just go with why you need an ecosystem, why do you need diverse or diverse um, supplier chain, uh, supply chain diversity? It is because look at what's happening right now with COVID. You never want to put all of your eggs in one basket. And that to me is why there is an ecosystem. That's why there needs to be an ecosystem. And that is why there needs to be manufacturing in the US, in China, in Indonesia, in Malaysia, in other, all other countries. We need all players. And at the end of the day, the whole goal is to make a living from your passion. And the road that you take to get there is going to look different year to year. It could look different month to month. But mm. the whole point is to have an ecosystem, have a supply chain that's diverse enough so that when something like this happens, we are not all scratching our heads and wondering, you know, how we're going to get through this. Uh, one, one second, I have a, a visitor right here who has a question. <laughs> I'm sorry. Hold, hold on one second. This is live, <laughs> so that is life. Right I is might have one too soon. Can see my, my daughter, Hi. she has a question. <laughs> um, um, okay. Okay, tell her to give me just a few minutes. I'll call her back, okay? Okay. <laughs> I might have a visitor too, so. Yes, I'm sure. <laughs> we got the tiniest visitor. Um, yes. <laughs> so, so diverse, diverse, diversifying your supply chain, I think, is the most important thing. That's what's going to ultimately allow us to weather these different storms. And this is probably not the most popular opinion. However, things are changing and things, th I think that this tide will end up shifting and equalizing over the years. But China is the world's manufacturing center for a very real reason, for a very real couple of reasons. And right at this moment, even with what's going on with COVID, there is not another country who can match the velocity, speed, and price at which China can produce items. And it is because they were very intentional about how they built infrastructure and who they gave business loans to, and they had a 40-year plan. Think about that. A 40-year plan to become the world's number one place for manufacturing. And boy, have they blown that plan out of the watcher. They have achieved that and more. The U.S., although we used to be a crown jewel of manufacturing, we weren't as strategic. And I don't think, because we're a democ democratic society, our presidents change every few years. The direction and strategy of our, com our country changes slightly every few years. We just, I don't think never, we never set our intentions as tightly and our focus as, as laser sharp on, on manufacturing and making it competitive as, country, as China did. And the result of that is that, yes, it's way, way, way cheaper to, to manufacture in China. But not only that, um, because China has had this manufacturing focus, they've also developed some of the world's best tailors. And they have been doing this for a number of years. It's generational there. And because of that, they've perfected techniques that allow them to create structured gowns in a matter of weeks. I've seen wedding dresses be put together in a freaking, you know, three-day period, like a complete wedding gown put together in three days. And the price is still one-third of the cost of what we could do it for here. So there's a lot of factors that go into it. I don't think it should be an us versus them. I think it should be a, let me look out here in the world and see who the best partner can be for me right now. And right now for a lot of us, it's partners based in China. For some of us like you, I think you mentioned having some connections in uh, Indonesia. For those projects, your partners right now are best located in Indonesia. I do have some American-based partners that I work with in some of my other businesses because I just prefer a partner that is in my same time zone and we're on the same page and we're up at the same time. So diver diversifying 
that supply chain is in developing different sales channels is should be our focus it shouldn't be where our dresses are made honestly because at the end of the day we're here to make money and I, like i said the paths that we take to do that will look different every single year so perhaps right now it's better for you to manufacture in china in two or three years that may change it may be that you're manufacturing in the usa i just don't think we should be so tied to um the us versus them and feeling like if it's not made in america americans are losing out we're not losing out we're not losing out exactly i mean what i've noticed as well is that i mean some people have um talked about this in other types of sectors that americans went away from those kind of jobs mm -hmm. we didn't want to assemble anything we didn't want to um manufacture things we didn't want to do any of that mm -hmm. these days there's even like the fact is people don't want to pay for somebody to hand make something for them here in the u.s right. like um i did start off sewing all my dresses by myself and even like when i do take on like you know projects here and there or if i do alterations and stuff like that people want the lowest price they absolutely can get mm -hmm. and the consumer is showing us with their dollars um what they care about yes, so if they yeah. care about speed and price then we as business owners sometimes have to just kind of respond to that or else mm -hmm. you're gonna be like a lot of the manufacturers here in the u.s that shut down you're not going to be able to compete. You're not going to be able to um, to to serve customers, to serve clients. Um, so that's really something to think about. Now, I just want to um, just jump in real quick and talk about a few things um, that I have had going on, and then get your take on how can we kind of work together, um, the U.S. or U.S.-based manufacturers and china and i have some ideas which i would love to share with you because okay. to me this is a conversation so the other sessions were like panels um this one is a conversation i think because um your insight is awesome and i think a lot of designers since they're not knowledgeable about about this sort of thing mm -hmm. um they don't know who to talk to and how to navigate this on their own um and don't really have ideas for options and things like that so Basically, in my own hometown, I'm working on, so just really quickly, I'm sure you've heard of the maker movement. Um, you know, people hand making things. Um, of course, we have light manufacturing, and then we also have like welding and electrical manufacturing and, you know, all that sort of thing. But sewn trades are actually starting to make a bit of a comeback. Mm -hmm. We're still far off from China, though, because right. we don't have, like China had that 40-year plan. Um, and they developed the best tailors and you know uh -huh. things like that so we, we're not there yet by any means but here in my city for example i'm part of um the urban manufacturing alliance so that's nationwide the urban okay. manufacturing alliance is basically the point is to bring uh, manufacturing back here um to the u.s um and my focus is on sewn trades and i don't believe that it has to be us versus them just because from working, doing this for years, working in the industry, I see that one thing that we did go away from is the sample room model of having a sample room here and then sending it out to get made overseas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at things and we're thinking like, oh, there, it has to be us or them. It cannot be both. But here's the thing. You can develop your line, your dresses, your patterns, whatever here in the U.S., then when you get like a large order, have it made overseas. Mm -hmm. So you're still having people sewing, you're still keeping, um, you know, the trade alive. Um, people like, you know, our, our folks here can learn to sew, can learn to assemble goods and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And you can still get what you need made in a professional manner by working overseas. Um, I know you're in Memphis and even in Knoxville, Knoxville, Tennessee. I don't even know how close that is. My mom is from Nashville, just so you know. But anyway, um, but no, it's not Knoxville, it's Nashville. Yeah. So I was gonna say that in Knoxville there was a there's a program kind of similar to what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, but it is Nashville, it's not Knoxville. My mother is from Nashville. Okay, cool. She's great. Okay. <laughs> we got that out the way. But yeah, so in Nashville, they're also doing like um 
like a push for urban manufacturing, um, working on stone trades, working on maker movements and things like that. Um, do you think that there is the ability to work together, you know, as designers um, can utilize local or domestic manufacturers or domestic sample rooms and then also follow that model send it out to get made overseas once um you know you actually place orders because that means then that you could continue to take orders instead of you're stuck with that one dress for x amount of months while your business isn't growing right yeah i think we we have to think about how do we co-op we have to think about that um especially as independent um bridal designers um, and that's really when you look at the model that even when you go back to China's plan and, and how they develop business there, when you look at some of the markets that we visit when we go, it's all co-op. It's all co-op. They share a lot of the common, uh, most commonly used items. Um, they all pitch in to maintain this building and it could be a massive building or it could be you know five or six stories high and it could be hundreds of individuals that are there in the market but it's run more like a co-op so it's a shared space they even though they may sell some of the same things a lot of them will share the cost of shipping and carrying carrying their items around shipping their items to a port in the u.s they co-op they are on the same page as it relates to our goal is to make money. So if working with you saves me money, then who cares that our you know shops may be selling the same things. So I think we do have to switch to that mindset and whether we whether it's a facility. Uh, can you go outside? Yeah, can you get put some pants on? Sorry. Um, whether we think about how to you know share sample rooms whether we think about sharing the cost of shipping uh fabric if we're using the same manufacturer i mean there's so many ways to co-op and reduce your expenses that it, it really is amazing but we have to be okay with someone knowing who we use that's another you know thing that we'd like to keep keep close to our chest. I don't really want anyone to know my manufacturer or who I get my fabrics from. There is a lot of sharing that happens, not to say that there isn't, but there's a level of competition that I think we, we don't do ourselves any service by feeding into because the way that I get a client is different from the way you get a client and the client that chooses you probably wouldn't have even chosen me because we're not, we weren't meant to work together. My aesthetic is not what she's looking for. So, you know, there's that piece is that our businesses will be protected no, no matter what. So why not work together? So yeah, I, I like what you said about sharing, um, having one sample room and being able to share the responsibility of manufacturing. I think it's, it's pretty brilliant. That's awesome. Um, especially because currently um, our government municipalities there are dollars for teaching you know especially in like urban settings there are dollars available like in grant funding workforce development things like that especially like if you get into the tech side of things so i want to talk about that for a second but um there are dollars available for um us to do things like i mean if you already know about sewing and manufacturing and all that stuff you can actually start co-op manufacturing um, businesses mm -hmm. and then um, you know and teach uh, people um, so one of the things that I'm working on is to teach um, disadvantaged women of color in the inner city how mm -hmm. to sew and then mm -hmm. we will create sewing rooms here and then um, shuttle that out you know like the actual final orders to overseas manufacturers maybe one day we would get big enough um, and I don't I don't want to own that process of um, manufacturing so really what I want to do is just kind of empower people to do that mm -hmm. and then like build this community of bridal designers who would then, you know, go into that pool of those co-op manufacturers, place their orders. And now we're keeping this circular ecosystem, um, you know, going instead of I'm just going to go to my one manufacturer. That's it. And, you know, you never use the skills that you have to grow another type of business 
um, mm -hmm. or, or just grow your community, you know, like there's so many ways that we can do um, and be supported, you know, because mm -hmm. there are going to be like, I think in this post COVID landscape, I mean, we've already seen how, you know, uh, the state of New York was looking for um, people to make masks and to buy masks from and you know hospitals and towns and cities were looking for um robes and different ppe that was needed so it's already clear that if we came together and came up with solutions you could actually make uh more money make a living from mm -hmm. your design and then have that money to be able to pull pull back into your actual wedding dresses like why does it have to just be either or you know mm -hmm. now just to touch on i was um i i don't know if i actually shared this in uh the sessions um the information for the sessions but one thing i wanted to talk about was that the digital and uh technology landscape in terms of fashion is mm -hmm. changing in such a way that because we're doing less physical touches, you know, all the social distancing, all that stuff, um, it's starting to be clear that we are over developing and over producing. Mm -hmm. And because we are overproducing, there are ways that designers can capitalize on that as well by the usage of 3D rendering, digital um, illustrations and digital designs, CAD art, um, and even old fashioned sketches. So mm -hmm. that means like, you know, one of the th reasons why I created this summit again was to recession proof your biz. So if you can draw or you can learn <laughs> um, or you can hire other people right. who can help you take on those kind of orders, you could, um, you know, and, and train maybe a workforce of people who can just um, kind of like come up with these designs, you could, you know, help create sustainability for your business and for the earth okay mm -hmm. because now we're not overproducing um yeah i mean like right now digital is the way to go you know i mean we're doing virtual wedding dress um shopping um right. i have for years sold my wedding dresses with sketches mm -hmm. you know because i'm doing custom design like that is how people are buying and so i know we've gone away from that but i think that that's something to explore. Um, and I just really want to give people ideas, you know, mm -hmm. just give people ideas. Um, because honestly, I do think we're in a very unique time. And I think that people who think uh, with a growth mindset, instead of a, oh, this is the most terrible thing ever, mm -hmm. they're the ones that are going to make it through, you know. So okay. could you talk to us just a little bit about, I know that you um, started healthgearnow.com. Can you tell me what that is? And Superman. a little bit more about it sure as i have superman here with me um so health gear now we started back in um february and we knew that just from our dealings with as i mentioned we started getting word of this virus back in january and and how it could possibly impact so we kind of had a bit of a head start just Mommy. by being plugged in to a lot of our um, well, I have a oh, good job sweetie okay. um so we we kind of had a head start just knowing the landscape and kind of where things were headed and because of the network that we have there we had we started to see availability of ppe really early on and can you go to other one sweetie i'm talking thank you and so we just really took a chance. We knew that our wedding business, and when I say we, I'm talking about my team and I, we knew our wedding business was probably going to come to a grinding halt. We also knew that the China Connect, the tours and the sourcing projects were probably also going to come to a halt. And we thought, we don't want to be sitting on the sidelines, you know, how, what our opportunities are out there. And in, at the same time, I was looking for PPE for my own family and some organizations here. And I just said, hey, y'all, I'm about to order some stuff for myself. Does anybody else want anything while I'm ordering? And whoosh, oh my God, I mean, we were off to the races. I had no idea that the response would be what it was. In a matter of days, we had a website up. We were actually, oh, sorry. So um, <laughs> we had a website up. We were off to the races. So 
um, that's how we started Healthcare Now. And we've since modified our strategy. We've since, you know, started working with other businesses, local um, pharmacies and things like that. And we are, uh, it's a full-fledged business. Now, what remains to be seen is how long people will need masks, how long people will want to purchase them, how long businesses will want to supply them to their employees. But we, um, it, it's definitely kept us busy and it's kept us with a income coming in. So it's been great. That's awesome. Um, I know that because a lot of people, including myself, were making masks and were basically using it like as a way, you know, to protect the health of others. Maybe they need mm -hmm. it for themselves, maybe they need it for family, maybe they are making money off of the mask. Um, but not thinking about like a long-term strategy. However, I have been hearing that we may be wearing masks for the next like 18 months or so, you yes. know? Um, and so because of that, it is a viable business concept, either um, partnering with a, an overseas, and most likely it's gonna be overseas, partnering mm -hmm. with an overseas manufacturer who makes masks and PPE or making your own, you know? Um, and, and a way to do that could also be partnering with an overseas manufacturer, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So it's interesting you mentioned that. Um, so we are launching a, um, it's the China Connect shop where we're selling, um, you'll be able to find templates and vendor lists already created so that when you're ready to pivot into manufacturing, um, it takes a bit of the guesswork out of what you'll need to do. So for mask makers, bridal designers, um, people wanting to start their own wholesale um, mass supply business, we've got a wonderful um, list of resources that can be purchased that will make your life so much easier when you're thinking about, like for yourself, if you're making masks now, well, at some point, you're probably going to want to partner, like you said, with someone who can make masks, or perhaps you want to purchase 50% of your masks pre-made and then offer customization options for the other 50%. Well, of course, now China is, you know, again, leading the world in mass production, not just the disposable ones, but the colored ones, cotton ones, the polyester ones. So we'll have options for people to pool um, vendors and start immediately working for with them. So, and part of part of why we're doing this is to keep up with the landscape. That's what we do at the China Connect is we connect businesses with direct factory pricing and open up a world of new options for different products and scaling and expanding. And so this is no different except that the need has changed, the actual product has changed. Now it's PPE, now it's you know mask and different things like that. So we're, we're trying to keep up, like I said, it's really busy, but we're trying to keep up and we'll um, be launching the China Connect shop uh, next week. That is awesome. And I'm gonna check it out for myself. So thank you, you for that. Just let me know what you need, yes. Please do, please do. <laughs> Yeah, it's um, um, <laughs> one of those things that you have to meet the current landscape. Yeah. And, you know, people are still selling shoes and clothing and jewelry, but now yeah. we're focusing on what do what does the world need right now? And yeah. the world needs PPE. So, yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, how can people get in contact with you? Yeah, absolutely. So you can reach me on my Instagram pages. Um, I have three. So the first one is Jelana Marie Bridal. That's my Instagram and website. So J-A-L-O-N-A-M-A-R-I-E bridal.com and Instagram, Facebook as well. Um, for the China Connect, we are at the China Connect across all social media platforms. And our website is thechinaconnect.com. And then um, for Health Gear Now, we are at healthgearnow.com and Health Gear Now on all social media platforms. Awesome. So thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. Um, I hope that we'll see you again on um, another series yeah. or a masterclass because this was, to, this was valuable fun. for me. <laughs> good. Good, good. Um, so thank you and I hope you have a great day. Bye. Thank you, you too. You too. Thanks everyone for joining. Yes. Hope you had a good time and learned a couple things. All right, have a good day. Bye. Bye.